Hi, I'm Micah Halpern. Thank you for joining me today as I do some thinking out loud. Our first segment is called Background Briefing. The first thing I've been thinking about is Israel's attack on Iran's nuclear enrichment lab at Natanz. Iran's nuclear development site, Natanz, was the target of not just any attack. It was the target of a surgical attack. The strike set Iran's nuclear development program back by several months. That setback is good news for the Western world, but that does not necessarily mean it was bad news for Iran. With one surgical strike, Iran became empowered. Iran now has the upper hand in the ongoing talks to kickstart the nuclear deal. Iran is now the victim. According to a report published in the Wall Street Journal, Israel informed the United States that they were going to attack the site. Note the wordage. Jerusalem did not ask permission of the United States. Jerusalem alerted, informed the United States. That alert is part of a new understanding that exists between the Biden administration and the Israeli government, which is changing, by the way, as we speak. Neither country should be surprised nor caught off guard by the actions of the other. The surgical strike was also covered in the Iranian media. The former head of Iran's nuclear energy organization, Fayadun Abbasi Dabiani, described the strike saying, the design of the enemy was very beautiful, unquote. Coming from Iran, that's very high praise, deservedly so. The attack took place 50 meters or 164 feet below the ground. The attack successfully destroyed the electrical system and the backup electricity and the cables that powered the nuclear centrifuges. No one was injured, no one was killed. The damage was severe, but it was all structural. The reason the Iranians built this facility and the energy nerve center 160 feet below the ground was plain and simple, to withstand missile strikes. It took great creativity coupled with critical planning to carry out the successful operation. It was precise and specific. The attack required the smuggling in and the placing of explosives that were to be triggered remotely. Iran recognizes the special skill demonstrated by this attack. In fact, they reported the fact of the attack in their own media. The truth ends there. They say that it was the work of traitors, and they say that those responsible for the attack have now been arrested. The truth is, Iran has no idea how the attack was carried out. Iran did not learn from their experience, because in July of 2020, a similar attack successfully took place at Natanz. Only the difference in the July explosions is they were above ground and wiped out 75% of the Iranian uh, centrifuge development system. There were operational rules when it comes to strikes. If a strike is successful as a test, and if the opposition does not plug their holes, the attacker expands on their original plan. If the holes are plugged, you try something new. Iran points their finger at Israel's involvement in this Natanz attack, but they have admitted that in 2018, Israel did steal the Iranian nuclear archive. Iranian nuclear organization made their admission official via the official Iranian news site, Mare News. Momin Rezai, the Secretary of the Expediency Discernment Council, which reports directly to the Supreme Leader, said, quote, before this, documents from our entire nuclear archive have been stolen. And before that, few suspicious drones came and did some work, unquote. Israel had planned this operation for months. The materials were smuggled in over time, and then Israel waited for the proper time and the appropriate reason to execute their attack. The time was now. Israel struck as Iran was making the transition to 60% uranium enrichment. 60% is 20 times the agreed upon enrichment quotient of the original nuke deal signed in 2015 by Iran and the P5 plus one, the five permanent members of the United Nations Security Council plus Germany. Iran argues that because the United States withdrew from the agreement in 2018, the original deal is no longer valid. They argue that they are free to do whatever they want regarding all forms of nuclear development, including enrichment. The P5 plus one want to simply reinstate the deal. Iran wants the deal sweetened. Details are being set down and ironed out. 
Enriching the uranium to 60% is a perfect example of Iran's intentions. And 60% uranium enrichment is the perfect starting point for the talks for Iran. Iran is using the discussions to better their position. Israel struck the enrichment centrifuges to stop their development. And now Iran is playing the victim and they are pledging revenge. Revenge may be sweet, but for Iran, it's not so simple. Iran will plot and Iran will execute attacks against Israeli targets. Attacks against Israeli merchant ships on the high seas is one of the form of revenge. Iran will announce those attacks and announce that they have been successful. But attacking merchant ships is not enough. In the past, Iran fabricated attacks and sites and the damage that was done. And that is what they're doing again. Iranian leadership, let's say for instance, just announced that they discovered and captured and destroyed a Mossad headquarters in Iraq, which is crazy. That was, they say it was responsible for executing the attack at Natanz. It plays very well into the Iranian media, but it's a total fiction. It demonstrates that within days of the attack, Iran can investigate and launch a raid that successfully evens the score with Israel. These are going to be very difficult few months ahead. Right now, Israel and the United States are not on the same page regarding Iran. They need to do more than simply inform one another. They need to work together to stop Iran's race towards nuclear weapons. Iran's goal is not just to procure nuclear weapons. Iran's ultimate goal is to provide those nuclear weapons to other countries around the world. Coming up next, points of view. This first column today comes from Ynet. As we begin, I need to explain a few things. Um, the Israeli news, especially the Hebrew news, covers the diaspora very well. Actually, the Israeli media does a much better job than most Jewish American media outlets. Israeli media deals with the diaspora in depth. They see meaning and significance to life in the diaspora. And frankly, they are also intrigued as to why Jews live outside of Israel. They are carefully monitoring anti-Semitism in the diaspora. Generally speaking, all the Hebrew print and online press do a spectacular job of this. They have a bias, obviously. They are far more interested in the diaspora than American Jews are interested in Israel. I say this not simply because I write a weekly column in the Jerusalem Post. I'm speaking also of the Times of Israel, Haaretz in English, Ynet, and many other outlets. And that is why I so often turn to Israeli newspapers for these columns. Whether they are discussing the diaspora or Israel or numerous other issues, they are well-researched, well-written, and well and thoughtful. Now to the column itself. This column is actually not about the diaspora. It's about COVID, and it warns Israel about celebrating a victory too early. It's written by Sarit Rosenblum, and it was published on April 18th, 2021. The column is entitled, A Cautious COVID Celebration. Subtitled, Opinion. Israel must still secure future vaccine supplies and be concerned over variants such as the newly discovered Indian mutation and the South African strain, both confirmed to have reached Israel's shores. Rosenblum begins. Last week's Independence Day was celebrated by Israelis in a manner none could imagine just months ago. Multi-generational families gathered together, free from social distancing, as they celebrated the birthday of the country and the personal freedom to congregate and enjoy simple human contact. Thanks to a successful vaccination drive, the number of new infections from COVID-19 continues to decline, while hospitals see fewer virus patients who require intensive care. On Sunday, schools resumed in-class learning for all students and Israelis were able to breathe freely outdoors after masks were no longer required in the open air. But we must all remember that despite our newfound joy, the situation is still fragile. Sarit is correct. She warns that Israelis must be careful, must be vigilant, especially because the South African variant is prevalent in Israel and does punch through the vaccines. Rosenblum continues, and she concludes, this is not a game. We have just one chance to ensure that our vaccination drive remains a success so that our return to normality can be long lasting. If we do not control our borders, if we play a game of Russian roulette with our public health, another matter not yet resolved is the acquisition of more vaccines for future use. 
Israel will be competing with all other nations to obtain the necessary supply of doses, and our politicians must ensure that supply at any cost. If they fail to do so, they will be responsible for the resurgence of the virus. These are important words of advice. Thank you, Sarit Rosenblum. As an addendum, the government of Israel has already begun the process of securing more vaccines for exactly that, for future use. Next up is an AP column. That's the Associated Press. It raises some very important questions about Iran and the powerful Iranian Revolutionary Guards Corps, also known as the IRGC. The column was published on April 13th, and it's entitled, Iran's Powerful Guard Faces Scrutiny After Attacks. Subtitled, Analysis, Tehran's paramilitary force is rarely publicly criticized, but with recent attacks on its assets and some of its leaders now considering vying for the presidency, the guard's influence and failures could become fair game. The column begins. The recent sabotage at Iran's main nuclear enrichment facility is just the latest setback for the country's Revolutionary Guard. Though the paramilitary force is rarely publicly criticized due to its power, but with some of its leaders now considering vying for the presidency, the Guard's influence and failures could become fair game. And now AP starts to list why people are starting to question the IRGC. The column continues. In just over the last year, the Guard shot down a Ukrainian commercial airliner, killing 176 people. Its forces failed to stop an earlier attack against Iran's Natanz facility and the assassination of a top scientist who started a military nuclear program decades earlier. Meanwhile, its floating base in the Red Sea off Yemen suffered an explosion. Then on Sunday, the nuclear facility, of which the Guard is the chief protector, experienced a blackout that damaged some of its centrifuges. Israel is widely believed to have carried out the sabotage that caused the outage, though it has not claimed it. AP explains that in order to improve their image, the Guard produced slick movies about themselves and showed them on Iranian TV. AP concludes with a devastating observation and quotes a hardline Iranian media source. It reads, but there's a clear line between their idealized television version and the reality of these recent attacks striking the heart of one of Iran's most powerful forces. Quote, we spent our resources and capabilities for the production of TV series to portray ourselves as powerful in the fields of security and intelligence, as well as accusing our officials of spying, wrote the hardline daily, Jamuri Aslami, asking why recent attacks hadn't been thwarted. The election may be soon. We see more people soon asking that question publicly. This is a very important for all of us to see and know and think about. Next up is commentary through cartoons where pictures tell the story. I want to show you seven cartoons today and memes and headlines. The first meme is obviously a picture of Dr. Fauci, one of the most recognizable personalities on the entire planet. I am showing this cartoon not to discuss Fauci or to criticize him or to compliment him, just to laugh at the situation and the humorist in creating the meme is doing exactly the same. Sometimes we all need to laugh at our situation. And it's pointed out that the memes especially is very important. And as we read it, it sort of tells us that we should laugh. All I'm saying is that all the zombie movies begin with some dude in a lab coat telling us everything is under control. That's funny. Next up is another funny meme that shows us how smart children can be. The meme reads, an elementary school class goes on a field trip to the police station. The officer points to the 10 most wanted list and tells them that they are the most wanted fugitives in the United States. A little boy says, he's the most wanted in the USA? Officer says, yes. The little boy asks, why didn't you keep him when you took his picture? As the saying goes, out of the mouths of babes. The next picture is perfect picture of those who love Star Trek. No one just likes Star Trek, by the way. You either don't care at all <laughs> or you love Star Trek. But everyone knows about Star Trek. The Vulcans have an expression. 
in Star Trek. It's live long and prosper. These street signs together with the crossing light are perfect. For those wondering how you got the fingers on the lights to give the Vulcan sign, it's very simple. Someone simply used the black marker to fill in the area in between. Next, uh, continuing on the theme of Star Trek and Spock and Vulcan themes, only this uses the song from S the Steve Miller Band. Spock is playing guitar. Above him, the lyrics of the song read, some people call me the space cowboy, some call me the Vulcan of love. Of course, the real words are the gangster of love. That, by the way, was first released in 1969. Next picture is a play on a classic television comedy that ran from 1978 to 1982. It was called WKRP in Cincinnati. It was about a wacky radio station, and it was simply fun to watch. Um, this picture has most of the cast from the show in the current photo, but instead of WKRP, the caption reads AARP in Cincinnati the American Association of Retired People. In other words, my, how they have aged. Next up, actually, is a very funny take on our society. It's a real-time headline, not a meme. And one must never underestimate the role of guns and the role they play in the United States. The headline reads, armed suspect robs convenience store, gets shot by every customer inside. This is not hard to imagine for anyone who lives outside the big cities in the United States. Finally, the last headline I want to show is just hilarious. Um, I read a statistic that every bank robbery over the past 10 years in the United States has been solved, yet people still rob banks. This may be why. The headline reads, a man tried to rob a bank after paying $500 to a wizard to make him invisible. That's funny. In a moment, more of my own perspective and a few predictions. Israel recently celebrated 73rd year of independence. This is no small feat. 73 years ago, most people doubted that Israel would survive a single year, no less 73 years. This past year was tough for everyone world over. And, but Israel seems to have emerged out of the dark tunnel called COVID earlier than everyone else. In honor of Independence Day for the first time, in 13 months, the city of Tel Aviv held large outdoor concerts for children. There was a limit of 650 children per concert. They were outdoors. And all the children were given free COVID rapid tests within the hour of the concert. Tests gave results within 15 minutes. And the test was developed, actually, by an Israeli biotech company. And the results came back soon. That's very fast, 15 minutes. As required for all large gatherings outdoors, even outdoors, masks were worn, even though they're not expected if you're out by yourself. Life is not yet back to normal, but in Tel Aviv, it seems that they're trying to get as normal as they can. Life goes on. Ephraim Halevi is the former head of Israel's Mossad. We know that Iran's nuclear enrichment facility was struck with a cyber attack that was a while ago. That attack, literally, it turned the electricity off on the nuclear enrichment center. Around the world, fingers pointed to Israel. Leadership in Israel did not deny responsibility, nor did they claim responsibility. They did, however, publicly comment that Iran was due for a lesson. Halevi had something to say about the entire situation. He said, and I'm quoting, Apparently those in Israel, the political leadership, want the attack to be attributed to Israel. Therefore, it must be assumed that the attack was indeed carried out by those who are now suspected of perpetrating it. Unquote. Now he continues to actually explain, and he says, we will make a big mistake if we think of Iran as an opponent who has two left hands. This is not true. When Ephraim Halevi speaks, we should pay attention carefully. This year, spring seems to be the season of Middle East elections. Syria has announced that on May 26th, they will hold presidential elections also. Assad will win a third term, there's no question, as president. These are not true elections in Syria, and his whim will be certain. The Assad family belongs to a minority group in the Syria. They're called the Alawites, and the Syrian Alawites control the brutal security forces. Opposition is not tolerated. As part of the Syrian election law, a candidate must have lived in Syria for the last 10 years. So there's no opposition in Syria. In 2011, protests in Syria began in the south of the country. The protesters were asking for election and political reform. 
the protests were crushed. And so began the civil war that has, for the past 10 years, devastated the country. The only question about Syria's upcoming election is not who will win, but whether Bashar Assad will win 85%, 95%, or 98% of the vote. Mark my words. Elections for the Palestinian legislature are scheduled to take place on Thursday, May 22nd. Presidential elections are scheduled for the 31st of July. Polls are telling us that Fatah, the ruling party of the Palestinian Authority, and the PLO, is having a difficult time getting a majority or even a plurality. Because of these polls, I anticipate that the elections will be postponed or even canceled. The Palestinians will blame it on Israel. They will claim that because Israel is not permitting Palestinians residing in Jerusalem to vote or even run for election, they cannot hold a true election. That, of course, is simply a smokescreen. It is a contrived excuse to save Fatah with Abbas as its head and embarrassment of losing. It really is a big deal. Losing this election would not just be an embarrassment. Losing the election would mean the end of the Palestinian Authority and the end of Fatah as we know it. In the meantime, there are several parties that are contenders in this election. They include Fatah and Fatah breakoffs, but they also, of course, include Hamas. They are the biggest contender. If the elections take place, there will be serious changes in the Palestinian Authority. If not in the total implosion, the situation could certainly devolve into armed conflict between the factions. The United States has made it known to Israel that they are displeased with the strikes on Iran. The U.S. is especially unhappy with Israel's boasting about their success and claiming responsibility for the attacks, something that Israel had been loath to do in the past. When there is an element of doubt, it leaves the target, in this case Iran, questioning not just whether it was Israel, but if the strike was co a coordinated effort. Was the United States involved? Was there intel from agencies from other countries? Were there neighboring countries involved in the act? The United States is concerned because Iran has announced that they are enriching uranium to 60%. That's 20 times the agreed upon enrichment level. Because of the strike at Natanz and the strikes on the Iranian ships, all courtesy of Israel, the U.S. is going to have a difficult time at the negotiation tables in Vienna. What we have here are two very arrogant nations. The United States is dictating to Israel. The United States believes that it can tell the world and Israel what to do and what not to do. Israel, meanwhile, is telling the United States that they will do what is necessary in order to achieve the safety of their citizens. Neither country is about to change their point of view. Iran is masterful at using their own media to develop a narrative. And one of the literary devices they often use is making things up. Fiction. The Iranians exaggerate and they fictionalize. For example, they say that they have more weapons than they really have, or that they have new weapons. They say that they have attacked and hit targets, which never happened. And it's sheer fantasy. They deny the damage or the extent of the damage or their infrastructure damage, their military damage. They even deny the size of their population. So when Iran threatens revenge against Israel on the same day that they claim to have discovered, conquered, and destroyed a Mossad house in Iraq, fake news antennae must go up. Fact is, there is no such Mossad house or houses to discover in Iraq. The entire episode looks great on Iranian media and makes Iranian leadership look strong for having avenged the Taz strike, which Israel purportedly perpetrated. But it is a total fiction. But fiction and fantasy never stops Iran, and it plays very well in the Iranian media. The Biden administration has slapped Russia with a series of sanctions. The announcement about these sanctions was unclear as to its timing. There was no date given to when these measures would go into effect. It did, however, explain that included in the sanctions would be a list of banned companies, also included will be the expulsion of diplomats. And finally, the sanctions will prevent the United States banks from buying any Russian bonds from Russian Central Bank, from their National Wealth Fund, and from Russia's finance ministry. 
This is a major step in the right direction. Russia has been a significant agitator in the U.S. political arena and U.S. financial markets. When it comes to foreign affairs, the Russians tease and taunt the United States all the time. In response to Biden's announcement, by the way, Moscow said that they are considering a response which may also include counter sanctions against the United States. The Kremlin spokesman explained that, quote, the principle of reciprocity of such matters has not been canceled, but everything will depend on the decisions made by the Russian head of state. And by the way, they have already announced that they will be expelling U.S. diplomats. Every decision in Russia, we all well know, is made by the head of state. We've been thinking out loud about a lot today. Now that you know what I've been thinking, let me know what you're thinking. Email me at micah at jbstv.org. Tweet me at Micah Halpern. Tell me what you think. Before we end, let me leave you with one picante piece of information. I'm sure you recognize that earlier I used an expression called the diaspora. The word uh, is very important. It means the Jewish community living outside the land of Israel. The word in Hebrew is tfutzot. Another word often used is galut or in Yiddish galus. But they don't mean the same thing. And it's important to distinguish the difference between these words. Tfutzot, diaspora, and galut. Galut is exile. Galut is the Jewish community that existed outside of Israel before there was or is a state and a return to Israel. For those who live in Galus or Galut, Israel does not exist. The state might exist, but for these people, even if they live within the state, they're still in Galus, in Galut. Zionism changed that for many Jews. The creation of the state ended the state of Galut, and those now living abroad live in Tfutzot, in the diaspora. It's an important distinction. Thank you for thinking out loud with me, Micah Halpern. Let's think out loud again next week on JBS. Mm-hmm.